Okay, I think we're good. I'll get started. Um, the slide says, Welcome to Linux Plumbers 2019, but I know you're only here for the networking track. <laughs> Regardless, welcome everyone. Thanks for taking the time to travel out to beautiful Lisbon uh, and to see all the amazing talks that we're going to have these next couple of days. I've been asked to show these uh, welcome slides, even though uh, we had the first session starting at 10 a.m. I thank all of our sponsors. Here they are on, on the screen. Uh, Facebook also uh, sponsored our networking track in Vancouver, too, so thanks, thanks for them again. Uh, we have to appreciate these people because otherwise we wouldn't be able to have this fantastic event without all of their incredible support. Here is the wireless information. If you don't have it already, I think it's on the back of all of our uh, name tags, too. So uh, there's that. And there's the URL of the code of contact, which we're required to let you know about. Um, yeah, so you should go read that if you're interested in the policies and everything as far as that's concerned. Uh, there's where the schedule is. You can click on the different things in the networking track to get to when your favorite talk's going to be. Um, we're on Portuguese time, which means that we start at 10 a.m. and uh, lunch is at 1.30, and then our evening events are in the 7 to 9 p.m. time frame. Um, Monday night has a rep welcome reception here, I think downstairs or upstairs or wherever, at the Seth Colina's room. Tuesday night, everyone's on their own. Go find somewhere to eat on, on your own. And then there's a plenary with buses that start at 7.30. I've been told that it's going to be a fantastic, uh, almost over the a top kind of event, really good food and everything. So that should be great. Um, we have almost all the slides on here. Uh, the people who have not put it up yet, you know who you are. I've already given you a hard time. We don't need to go into that any further. Um, but everything will be on here, so you don't have to hook your laptop up, and we can do operate very efficiently during this wonderful conference. Um, if you have any questions about the LPC event in any way, shape, or form, all these people on this list are fantastic individuals. I've been working with them uh, for the past uh, several weeks and months, and uh, they will be able to solve whatever problem you may come up with, and so you should go contact them. Okay? So without further ado, uh, Rupa Prabhu is going to come up and give her presentation on uh, VXLAN, multicast routing, and flooding. Uh, Rupa has been contributing to Linux networking for a significant amount of time, uh, in specifically when we needed to make statistics better with Netlink and everything, she made that happen. She's fixing bugs and bridging code and, and in those areas all the time. So uh, uh, please welcome Rupa Prabhu. Is it in this directory? Awesome. Cool. Thanks, David. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Rupa. Yeah, it's yet another VXLAN talk for me. I've been doing VXLAN talks for the past two or three years because that area is still being developed. There are a lot of RFCs coming out on optimizations to VXLAN and overlays in general in the data center. So it's, yeah, every year there's been a lot of work going on in this area. So Nikolai is, uh, Nikolai, I, I think he doesn't know that I, his name is on the slides, but he does uh, work with me on multicast. And he is actually an expert at Multicast. So yeah, uh, I'm glad that uh, my talk is the first. I, that means I get to <laughs> be done with it. But I'm sorry you have to listen to Multicast, the first thing uh, in the networking summit. <laughs> so uh, the agenda. And I'm very thankful for the Portuguese time. This is the first conference I've got to sleep a bit. Uh, for the people who are jet lagged, you know, you sleep for two hours and you wake up and then you get some sleep in the morning. Uh, okay, so agenda, VXLAN and flooding. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the VXLAN and multicast stuff. State of VXLAN and multicast for flooding and limitations of the current uh, implementation and fixes and futures. So few terminologies, these, um, are used mainly in the RFC, so I've just put a slide on. Uh, VTAP is nothing but a VXLAN termination endpoint. Uh, bum flooding is what is uh, usually 
used in the term for covering flooding, basically broadcast, unknown unicast, and multicast. PIM, uh, PIM is a very complex control plane protocol for multicast handling, and it is, uh, its deployment and management is complex, and that's why people don't use multicast in most situations, but I'll, you'll see why it's being used in, multi uh, in VXLAN environments. IPMR is basically, we use that to refer to the kernel uh, IP multicast routing stack. OIL is nothing but an outgoing interface list, and OIF, as you know, in the routing world, in the Linux kernel, it's the outgoing interface. And forwarding information is, uh, like the FIB, the bridge and layer two um, forwarding information is a database, is called FDB. And EVPN is something that I've talked in multiple uh, talks in the past. It's basically a control plane for VXLAN. It's becoming very popular. And uh, like I said, there are, every year there are more RFCs uh, uh, for optimizations in the VXLAN environment. So VXLAN is nothing but a UDP tunnel, as you all know. Um, I don't expect everybody to be working, most of them uh, here not, who don't uh, use VXLAN or overlays, but VXLAN in the data center, it is part of the infrastructure where it, your host probably does not see it in most of the cases, but about the host, once you enter the switch and the data center and the cloud sometimes is built on overlays, basically you tunnel traffic. And um, this is mostly layer two traffic. Your racks connected to other racks and to your even virtual uh, private cloud and so on. Um, and VXLAN tunnel endpoints are nothing but um, uh, the points where you, it's basically, if, you, if you're deploying Linux, it's basically a device that creates the VXLAN device, right? It uh, encaps and decaps VXLAN traffic. So it could be your host, hypervisor, container OS, or your cloud instance, or it could also be or your top of rack switch and other switches in the data center. So. And in any layer, like any other layer two environment, you basically learn information, forwarding database by flooding, right? Unlike routing, where there is a routing protocol which works with other routing protocols in, uh, in a distributed fashion to build your forwarding information, in layer two environments, you usually flood. And when you're talking about layer two environments that span the entire data center or the cloud, you tend to not flood because the flood domain is larger here and you want to reduce that flooding and flooding of broadcast traffic. Basically, when you talk about flooding, it's basically an ARP, uh, which is a broadcast which can be flooded to all the nodes in the data center. So uh, in the Linux kernel, the layer two forwarding information is, uh, especially for VXLAN, it is the Mac, VNI, DEST port, and DEST IP. And DEST IP is nothing but your remote uh, endpoint, VXLAN endpoint, um, and it's an IP uh, network because VXLAN uses an IP underlay. This is a pictorial representation of what I was talking about. There is, uh, these are two nodes uh, which are acting as VXLAN termination endpoints basically uh, initiating a VXLAN tunnel and terminating a VXLAN tunnel. And it's an, uh, it gives you an example of how the forwarding database is maintained. Sorry, I realize there is a typo there. It's VXLAN 10 in the forwarding database. Um, but um, as you can see, VTEP 1 has an IP and VTEP 2 has another IP and the, the UDP tunnel is basically using an underlay which is an IP unique, unicast underlay. So there are many ways uh, flooding is implemented in the VXLAN uh, uh, driver today. So an all zero MAC address is like a, your default route in your L3 domain. Basically, when you don't hit a specific MAC entry, you uh, hit the all zero MAC address and your, it'll uh, replicate or it'll forward to uh, any or flood to the uh, IP addresses that are there in that uh, list. So there is an example here for something called as head-end replication where you replicate at your source node, at your VTEP source, you replicate to multiple VTEPs. 
this example actually shows you two entries, but this uh, replication list can grow if you're talking about multiple racks in a data center like environment and each rack uh, is a tunnel endpoint. And these IP addresses at the end are basically your um, VTIP per rack VTIPs. And these uh, in cases, again, uh, can be populated by a control plane like eBGP, um, sorry, eVPN uh, using BGP. And the other way to flood is basically use multicast replication. So instead of replicating on the source uh, VXLAN tunnel endpoint, you use multicast so that uh, multicast, as you know, it has rep good replication um, properties. Basically, you send to a multicast using multicast on the source, but then you replicate on the other end when it reaches the destination. So VXLAN driver actually has all the um, support to use multicast. And it's used as an optimization for flooding. So here is um, a little more information. Uh, VTIPs uh, in a multicast environment or VXLAN tunnel endpoints in a multicast environment, they source and receive multicast traffic. And if you know of IGMP, uh, I've put a reference there. Uh, IGMP is a protocol that is used uh, to express interest in a multicast group. Many hosts do that, VMs and so on. Uh, VTEPs on routers will use the underlay IP multicast routing to route uh, the originated multicast traffic. So PIM is again, a, I have a reference there, it is a control plane for multicast. Uh, basically these are routers which build the um, IP multicast routing database in the kernel. So this shows you a picture of how uh, VXLAN with multicast underlay is done when the VTEP is on a host. Host here could be a hypervisor. So the VXLAN uh, driver today allows you to specify a multicast address and an uplink interface. So the host one, host two, um, they actually express interest in that multicast by doing an IGMP join. So that's how the switch knows that um, these hosts are interested in that traffic. That's how they forward you that multicast traffic. And on the routers, you have the PIMD, which is, a, which is again the multicast control plane, which builds that uh, multicast database, routing database. And as you can see, the IPMR table actually has an OIL list, which has uplink one and uplink two in its um, uh, outgoing list. So how does VTAP, VXLAN uh, tunnel endpoint on a switch look today? So VXLAN driver is configured uh, with the OIF for the multicast group, the same thing. If you use VXLAN today, you, can, you would specify the um, multicast group and the up, uplink port, but it allows you to specify just one uplink port. So in this, this picture actually shows where the problem is. IPMR thinks that uh, the, it needs to distribute multicast traffic on uplink one and uplink two. And VXLAN, which is on the uh, switch, it actually thinks that only uplink one is interested in multicast traffic. So they both, IPMR and VXLAN, are not uh, in sync with, e with each other. So if you can, uh, this actually points out that multicast on VXLAN driver actually it works best for the host case, but not where the switch uh, is the VXLAN tunnel originator. There is no multicast routing uh, lookup performed when uh, VXLAN driver actually initiates the multi multicast traffic. It only supports a static multicast OIL, like you saw, only uplink one. Does not work in cases where VTAPs are located on a multicast router. So basically, it does not work well, as you see in this picture, when the VXLAN driver and the PIM control plane are on the same uh, node. So the VTAP on the switch, the ideal case, this is what we want to get to, and this is what uh, this uh, talk is about, is basically uh, VXLAN driver only knows the multicast group to replicate to, and it relies on IPMR, the IP multicast routing uh, table in, on the same node to find the outgoing list of packets. So a little bit on multicast routing. Um, multicast IP routing, 
is used to distribute uh, to multiple recipients or multiple uh, recipients who are interested in the multicast traffic and that's how it is an optimized way to flood. Um, I also talked about PIM, so let's move on here. And Linux kernel multicast code is in IPMR.C. Received IP multicast packets actually get into IPMR input. And IPMR input actually decides whether it needs to forward or locally receive that uh, multicast traffic. Locally generated multicast traffic. And we're talking about locally generated here because v VXLAN NCAPT uh, multicast packets is what we're uh, interested in. And those actually hit IPMC output directly, which outputs it um, TX is it through a device. So locally generated packets don't go through the multicast routing lookup, and that's the problem that we see with VXLAN. Um, what happens is VXLAN actually sets, uh, it takes the device, it sets the OIF, and once it sets the OIF, this bypasses all uh, routing checks in IP route uh, output um, function and it hits IPMC output directly. So IPMR has IPMR input today, but no equivalent IPMR output, which is what is needed here. And IPMC output directly exmits it uh, out of the static OIF. This is just a picture of what I uh, described just now. VXLAN driver takes the uh, OIF and uses that OIF in the route lookup, and which is a problem. Yeah, so what this means is basically does not work. The OIF list that is used with VXLAN is not used, cannot be used in a dynamic multicast routing environment with PIM. Um, and why is this needed though? Uh, so distribution, like I uh, showed in one of the slides, the PIM or the uh, multicast control plane and IPMR know exactly how many paths they have to distribute the multicast uh, traffic over. Also, in cases of uh, multi-homing, multi-homing is something that I talked in at last LPC, again involving uh, VXLAN, um, and a PIM implementation uh, that understands uh, multi-homing is actually capable of um, programming the IP multicast routing database with, uh, with OIFs that point to the peer multi-homing routers to reroute the traffic. So that's why the dynamic environment is important. So the need for IPMR output, um, IPMR, uh, so basically uh, all multicast traffic that locally generated multicast traffic actually hits IPMC output and it does not go through IPMR uh, lookup. That's uh, what this talks about again. So the changes required here, the OIF in VXLAN driver is still needed because you want to uh, tell the kernel data path that there is a multicast, um, there is a node or the local, uh, there is a endpoint on the local node that is interested in, multi in the multicast traffic. This is for basically for RXing the multicast traffic, uh, uh, receiving VXLAN uh, tunnel packets and terminating them. And this has to be achieved by IGMP join. So you need the OIF. But what you uh, want to do is you do not want to use that OIF in the routing lookups. So basically, uh, this has to be another VXLAN flag. Um, VXLAN driver at this point has a lot of flags. Uh, and it, this flag basically tells you that use IPMR or IP multicast routing to uh, find the real outgoing list. We do have patches, but um, they are still being soaked basically and uh, IPMR patches also need an IPMR6 equivalent. So, and we have a huge test suite to test um, VXLAN uh, overlays, but it does not support IPv6 at the moment and so, uh, yeah, actually we carry a bunch of patches to even create VXLAN on IPv6 underlay and then have it stitched into our test uh, framework to be able to test this. And um, 
This is this actually touches all locally generated multicast traffic. So uh, we are um, hesitant. So basically, we're trying to see how much test coverage we can uh, get because uh, we don't want to break any multicast applications, other applications. So I think. What we have done is the code right now, it will fall back to the old IPMC output um, if the IPMR forward lookup fails. And with this, you can see um, a slight indirection in the output path. Basically, it does an IPMR output, which does an IPMR lookup on the transmit path, and then uh, finds the outgoing list instead of relying on the outgoing list from the packet or uh, the flow that came into IP route uh, output. And then eventually does an IPMC output as usual. So I'm almost reaching the end of the talk. Uh, bigger picture, this is a busy slide, but um, this is what it looks like. Rack one and rack two, you have switches that do um, are running a multicast control plane, they're running a VXLAN control plane, and they have the VXLAN uh, device to initiate and terminate VXLAN tunnels. And on each, each rack, uh, to cover the multi-homing case, there are these two uh, switches that are actually connected by a peer link um, to reroute traffic. And as you can see, the VMs in the racks, they eventually get connected to both the switches and there is a little bit of uh, work in the control plane. Actually, the control plane becomes more complex uh, when it involves a multi-homing case. And um, yeah. So futures, um, there are a lot of multicast optimi optimizations still being done for VXLAN, uh, mostly at the control plane level but then these end up requiring some changes in the VXLAN driver. For example, last year I talked about the same thing, scaling uh, the VXLAN forwarding database so that control plane, uh, for the multi-homing case, so that the control plane can insert and uh, uh, delete uh, or insert and reroute traffic faster. And I talked about FDBs using the next stop groups, and there is a next stop groups talk by David uh, sometime. I think it's the last talk, uh, yeah, on Wednesday. So these optimizations are still uh, being done. For example, selective multicast in this case is, um, as I've talked before, IGMP uh, is something that is used to determine uh, sources, or sorry, receivers that are interested in a multicast group. And if and that, that is again IGMP reports and I, there is a, a lot of uh, things that go on in an IGMP protocol. And if you can, uh, um, for example, the layer two domain is being extended to, using VXLAN to a larger domain now, and having this IGMP flooding also to determine receivers and uh, sources across the data center becomes. Uh, heavy. Again, it's like uh, a lot of tra traffic. And so there is a lot of RFCs go and discussions in IETF right now which are going around uh, to better implement IGMP for these environments. Basically, the control plane carries some of this IGMP distribution. Instead of flooding to over the VXLAN tunnels, they use the VXLAN uh, uh, control plane to actually distribute this via BGP. So that's another thing that will require changes in the VXLAN to handle IGMP or handle multicast uh, forwarding information. Then uh, we have a similar concept of ARP proxy to avoid ARP flooding over VXLAN tunnels. Similarly, IGMP and MLD proxy um, is also being discussed. Uh, there is an RFC for this to um, yeah, proxy these requests. This is a list, a long list of RFCs if you're ever interested in multicast and uh, VXLAN. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it. Uh, thank any you, Rupa. Uh, if we have any questions, uh, make sure you get one of these boxes and speak into it because everything's being recorded. Yeah, he'll throw it at you. So this, wow. <laughs> 
Hi, I'm Dave Todd. In part, I'm trying to cut down the scope of multicast, which is my talk tomorrow. Oh, um, okay. One of the questions that I have that makes my head hurt is what happens if you try running a multicast protocol over this multicast protocol? An example would be MDNS. Mm -hmm. If I do a uh, service lookup for that, what happens? I don't know, my head hurts too. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Actually, the multicast control plane is, is uh, very horrid. And the, with the multi-homing, I actually want to thank a lot of people who work on the multicast control plane, who live this every day. And yeah, sorry, I don't know. Any other questions? I could. I feel like someone took it off the head one time. <laughs> That's the whole idea. You mentioned a lot about VXLAN across the data center. Uh, do you also see a use case for VXLAN across multiple geographically dispersed data centers? Or is that not scaling well yet? So there is um, something called the, the same EVPN across data centers. It's called uh, EVPN DCI, Data Center e Interconnect. So yes, there, is, there are RFCs to cover that as well, basically, um, yeah, across the WAN. Um, yeah. And I didn't lose my head. Um, hi. With respect to her question, following on on that, with edge and IoT, we might have VXLANs that you know span geographic areas. What if you don't know that you want to subscribe to a certain network? I mean, how do you handle that? Um, as a node? If as a, it, this feels a lot like publish and subscribe, and what if there's a new network you want to be a part of and you don't even know yet to register that to you want discover, to discover, I mean, so new networks are discovered by flooding, is that what you're getting at? Uh, yeah, but then it felt like you had to say, I want to join a network foo, and you don't even know there is a foo initially, and then, so you have to tell all the nodes and the switches in between, hey, please find me foo type of thing. Yeah, so that's usually achieved by flooding, and multicast is used as an optimization to that flooding. Okay. Okay, so basically your VXLAN tunnel endpoints, they, all this, uh, register a multicast group, right? And every rack or every pod or a group of nodes, if your new network is a pod, it joins or it's built into the network as anything else. And um, the VXLAN uh, control plane, if it doesn't know about it, it has not discovered it yet, it'll resort to flooding. And obviously the administrator would have uh, configured a VXLAN multicast endpoint at that end. So what happens is you're, yeah, you will flood the traffic and that basically, if you think of it like an ARP request, so it will go to that other node and that node will actually flood it in the local domain. So it will get to all your nodes and they'll respond and that's how the whole uh, control plane gets, uh, yeah, all the, so knows with, about the hosts. So so with these, uh, you know, like with IoT and it being way more distributed, how would this affect your timeouts or time to live type of thing for these flooding packets? The IoT and VXLAN, I am not uh, very sure. It's, it's on all the kind of new, but I, I think this would be a use case just for security and overlay networks there. Yeah, sure. I've not seen any studies on the performance okay. impact of. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Scaling to IoTs. He can catch it. <laughs> there we go. Thanks. Um, Rupa, you said early in your, your talk that solutions to this problem involve either flooding when you have a, a VTEP endpoint that's as of yet undiscovered or using a controller to program your forwarding database. Yeah. What's the advantage to using multicast here? It seems like you're generating a lot of traffic for not necessarily a lot of, of value add in terms of, of discovery time. Yeah, so the, or for small environments, the orchestrator who knows about all the endpoints, like you know, some of these, um, what is that, virtual uh, hypervisors which provide a distributed uh, cloud or provisioning systems, they know about every node or every allocation of MAC address and IP and they can program their uh, control plane 
or the forwarding database saying that that node is present. But there is also this discovery factor, right? You have to provide flooding for those nodes that the control plane has not, does not know about yet for dynamically coming and going environments. So yeah, so that's why eVPN does exist and eVPN distributes this traffic, but still it allows for flooding for that small window when the control plane is catching up and the VMs are trying to reach each, reach each other. So. so this is potentially an additive technology, not a, a sole technology for solving yeah. this problem. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, thank you very much, Rupa. Thank you.